the church, find out more what's going on, and do grab one of these Next Steps cards. Let me leave your details on the back of that and leave it with the welcomers at the door. We'd love to get more connected with you and help you to get connected into the wider life of the church as well. But whether you're old or new, this is your first time or your thousandth time, and we all meet here um, in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's begin our time together by standing and singing praises to him. Let's be standing. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. given counsel to the Lord, who can question any of his words, who can teach the one who knows all things, who can fathom all his wonders. So as we stand, let's pray to our King together. Almighty God, who alone can bring order to the unruly wills and passions of sinful humanity, give your people grace so to live what you command and to desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, 
our hearts may surely there be fixed, where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's continue to sing together. Our great God, we praise you for who you are. We praise that you are the Lord God Almighty, the blessed Trinity, merciful and mighty. Help us this evening to see your glory, to see your grace, and to praise your name through Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, please do take a seat. I want to take a moment to make sure everyone's been warmly welcomed. I want to turn to the pew in front of you or behind you and say hello and give, have a warm welcome for each other.
Well, great to be um, continuing those conversations after the service over tea and coffee. Great to hear the church family bustling together with conversation. Yeah, please do continue later on as well. I've got a few notices, two notices I want to quickly mention um, specifically. There was more notices than that in the church email that comes out every Friday. If you're not getting those and you want to keep up to date with what's going on again, put your email address on one of these. Leave it with the welcomers. We'd love you to get those on Fridays. But the two notices I want to quickly draw your attention to are these. Number one, remember this Wednesday night, the most important night of the month in the life of the church. It's St. Andrew's night, the prayer night at the back of church, 7.30. If you've never been to one of those, why not come this Wednesday night? We pray for our church, for each other and for the city, and for the world. It's round tables, it's super relaxed, but super important. We'd love to see you there this Wednesday night. And then next Saturday is the St. Andrew's Woman. They're having their first woman's breakfast of the year, and Ali Heath-Taylor is going to be sharing about prayer and helping women to grow in prayer. It's free, but please do put your name. There's a sign-up sheet at the cross aisle there, so they can figure out how much breakfast to get um, for, for all of you. Um, so please do make a point of signing up for that. But that's something that's going to be a great time helping, helping the women of St. Andrews to grow in prayer. So prayer Wednesday night, prayer Saturday morning. Guess what we're going to do now? We're going to pray. Olivia's going to come and lead us now in a time of prayer. Thanks, Olivia. Um, I'm going to lead us in four short prayers. If you want to join with me in making these prayers your own, um, please join with me. And when I say God in your mercy, um, by responding with, hear our prayer. Dear Abba, thank you for church family. Um, we thank you that we've not been made to live in isolation, but in community. We lift up to you our brothers and sisters at St. James in Ham. We pray that as they study the book of Mark together, they would grow in knowledge and love of Jesus. We praise you for those taking part in Christianity Explored there. Father, please soften hearts and open eyes to your good news. We pray particularly for three people who you know by name taking part in this course. Please bring them to new life and relationship with you. We pray that you would raise up encourage and strengthen new leaders in St. James. And we thank you for the joy and celebration caused by a recent baptism. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we lay at your feet all that is coming up in St. Andrew's life. Um, we pray for events like the women's breakfast, the Skittles night, and the monthly prayer meeting. Um, and we pray that all of these places would be places that you build this church family together. But Lord, please give us a humility and an awareness that would stop us from being so closely knit together that there's no room for more people to be brought in. Help us to be a family that welcomes people with open arms. We praise you for the blessing of Wednesday evening this week with Living Out and for the encouragement it was to be together with some of the wider church family here in Plymouth. Lord, please teach us to speak the truth in love. And um, we're sorry for when we've spoken truth with harsh words or tried to love by denying truth. We pray that we'd be a family that denies self to follow you. Teach us to follow Jesus in what it means to truly live lives that aren't our own. And um, we thank you for your love, mercy and forgiveness that follows us as we walk with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the students here in Plymouth. We thank you for the university's Christian Union and their desire to know you and make you known on campus. Lord, on the run-up to Mission Week, um, we pray that you would soften hearts, you would make minds curious, and you would be building friendships so that more of your sons and daughters could be brought to you. Lord, we pray especially for freshers at the beginning of second term. We pray that you would be their comfort and strength um, in the face of so much change. And Father, we thank you for Roots Student Group here at St Andrews. We praise you for the community of students that you have brought together. Lord, please let this generation of students become even more hungry for your word. Let them be captivated by your love and unwavering in their desire to share it with others. 
Lord, let your love pour out of the hearts of these students and onto campus and let your name be glorified. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lastly, Father, we lift up to you the ongoing conflict in Israel and Gaza. Lord, there has been over 120 days of conflict and thousands of lives lost. Father, you are God of peace. Please bring a ceasefire and an end to violence. Lord, you are God of justice. Please give wisdom to political leaders worldwide who have an influence and a role to play. Lord, let them make decisions that bring lasting peace. Abba, you are a healer and protector. Please, by your hand, enable aid to reach the vulnerable and strengthen hospitals and medical workers overwhelmed with limited resources. Lord, give them all the equipment and resources they need to treat the sick and injured. Lord, you are God of strength. Please strengthen church leaders and Christian communities to show love and kindness and comfort those around them. Father, you are God of hope. We thank you that you are beyond the limits of this world and we pray that even in this brokenness you would be bringing new life in miraculous ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we're going to finish by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I love you. Thanks so much for leading us in prayer. Do grab your Bibles and open them. And we'll continue our series that we've been in for the last few weeks in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, a book that's been helping us to think about how we can take God more seriously. And before Tim comes to preach, Andrew's going to read that for us now. Thanks, Andrew. Good evening, everybody. This evening's reading is taken from 1 Kings, chapter 17, starting at verse 17. Ah, it says page 359. I'll leave that to say it's page 1229 on the order of service, but they're close. Okay. Chapter 17, verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She, she said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Do you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Andrew, thank you. Let's pray. The word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Almighty God, may we be filled with your words of truth this evening. May my words only testify to your goodness and truth. And would our hearts be shaped in response to your glorious goodness and truth, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. Great to see you all again. And welcome back to our series in 1 Kings. We're calling it Taking God 
seriously. But before we dive into those uh, verses on page 359, keep your Bible open, I want to introduce three people to you. Um, you might recognize them, but they are made up. And the question is, what links these people together? Firstly, Hazel. Hazel's been coming to, to church for a year or two. She's warmed to Jesus. She's been welcomed into the church. And there is meaning and love here that she hasn't known anywhere else. But Hazel's just started to develop some serious health problems, and her faith is decreasing. She's pretty close on giving up on Jesus altogether. That's Hazel. There's Ian. Ian's never been too fussed about whether there's a God or not. He knows what he stands for. He knows what he's interested in. You know, he respects people with any faith, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, Christian, Sikh. But for him, we all just need to find our own path. It doesn't matter which faith or none that we follow. That's Ian. Then Jared. He's been a Christian for longer than he cares to remember. He's in church on Sundays, plays his part here and there. But if he's honest... The keen faith in Jesus he had a decade or two ago is no longer front and center in his thinking. It's merely just a part of his life. Lots of things make up his life. That's Jared. I wonder if you can see what links Hazel, Jared, and Ian. I guess actually there's probably quite a lot of answers to that question. Maybe we could discuss it over a cuppa later. But if we sympathize with any of them, my hope is that these verses in 1 Kings 17 will be pretty significant this evening. Just look at where the chapter ends up. Verse 24. The woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. This woman has seen God in a new, bigger, and better way than before. And that's what Hazel, Jared, and Ian all need to see. The prophet Elijah has been staying at this widow's house. We were with them last week. And those are the very last words we hear her say. She's taking God seriously, more seriously than before, because she's seen his goodness, his life-giving power, and his uniqueness afresh. She's met with the Lord, and she wants to hang on God's every word from Elijah's mouth. And my hope is that each of us this evening, whether we see ourselves in Hazel, Jared, or Ian, will similarly see the Lord, Yahweh, God, more clearly as he is in these verses, and therefore take him more seriously. To help us do that, I've got three headings. I want us to see a questioning woman, the Lord of life and truth, and a man of God. So let's start with the questioning woman. Where are we? Do you remember? One Kings is about seven or eight hundred years before Jesus, and we've joined the story of this prophet, Elijah. And do you remember? He's told faithless King Ahab there's going to be a drought, which is going to last three years. And we saw last week, Elijah had left Israel. He's gone north to this foreign land, to Zarephath in Sidon, where he's staying with a widow and her son. You see, the good news of God has gone beyond the people of God. It's left Israel because God's people in Israel are no longer worshipping him. But day by day, miraculously, God was with Elijah. He's with this prophet. He's with the widow that he stays with and her son, And did you remember last week they were receiving literally daily bread as we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Just look down at the bottom of the previous page, verse 16. The jar of flour was not used up. The jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. So get your mind in this woman's life for a moment. Just picture what she's been through. She's a widow. She's already gone through the heartbreak of losing her husband to an early death. She's left with a young child. We're not quite sure how old he is, but life is pretty hard. She's a one-parent household, a woman, trying to gather food and water each day for her son with little or probably no income. Her son is her hope for her future and well-being whenever he's eventually grown up. They live 
in poverty. And then God sent a drought. Things are taking their toll. When we first met her, she said she was going to prepare a final meal, verse 12, that we may eat it and die. That's how she saw life. She had nothing left. She was giving up. And whichever gods that she and her community worshipped have not been able to help. But then Elijah arrives. He's a stranger bringing the promises of the Lord, his God. He promised each morning there'd be enough oil and flour afresh for a new loaf of bread. And, surprise, surprise, each morning she gets down to her jars of flour and oil and there's just enough for another loaf of daily bread. For months now, she's seen the Lord's providing enough oil and flour for the day. And if you asked her, it's pretty weird, isn't it? But she's grateful. This man, Elijah, must know some sort of God or deity who can provide food. But in her mind, he's probably just one more God among the many the people worshipped. But things take a turn for a worse. Verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally <gasps> stopped breathing. Her future ripped away. Heartbreak upon heartbreak. The tears would have fallen. She's lost her husband and her son. And she goes to Elijah in verse 18 and says, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? I think we can understand her questioning, can't we? Or at least we can begin to sympathize with what she says. Some of us here tonight will have asked God similar questions questions. Perhaps you're here tonight asking a very personal and similar question to this one. God, what are you holding against me? How have I done you so much wrong? Would you punish me in this way and show me no mercy? And as carefully as we can, we need to pause and ask, what assumptions lie behind these women's questions? She does get some things right. But you see, the major thing that she thinks is that God is one moment for her, the next moment against her. God is one moment providing bread, the next killing her son. And so she thinks God is uninterested in me, or moody. You know, this, uh, yeah, he, and it's predictable. This, this God in her mind is just like Baal. Do you remember that the whole of this passage in 1 Kings is against Baal, the God of the foreign nations, not of Israel. Baal was the rain God, and, and the people thought that he was predictable. Offer Baal the right sacrifices and... Hey, presto, you get rain. Upset Baal and, uh-uh, there's drought. But the true God revealed in the scriptures is bigger and more majestic than we can imagine. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're much higher. He's not what we hope a charm bracelet or a genie or a vending machine will be, doing just what we wish, just when we wish it. He is above us. We can't predict him or get his arm behind his back to tell him what to do. No, he is unpredictable in the sense that his plans and purposes and timing are not what we would choose. And yet he is not moody, but steadfastly good. When he appears to Moses in Exodus, he says this of himself. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. 
You see, if there's anything of Hazel in us, wanting to follow Jesus because everything will turn out just as I wish, or perhaps we follow Jesus for a long time and we are hurt, deeply hurt, that things haven't gone the way we wanted. Tonight, God wants you to see he's not moody. He is good. But he doesn't work in the way you expect him to every time, even when things are hurting. And that brings us next to the Lord of truth and life. It's important to see that what happens next enables this poor widow to say, now I know the word of the Lord from your mouth, Elijah, is truth. Because, again, this is pretty odd. Elijah takes the dead son in his arms and and takes him up to the room where he's been staying all this time. And let's speak about the elephant in the room. I don't know why the verse says he placed him full stretch on the sun. That sounds pretty strange. But I do know two things. Firstly, Elijah is not condemned in the story. If he'd done any wrong, it would be made clear. And secondly, this is a one-off. It is by no means an example for us to follow today. But what Elijah does is pray to the Lord his God. He's got a question. Verse 20. Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? We need to learn to pray our questions to God. He's big enough to take them. And after the question, he gives a request. Verse 21, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. God is also keen to hear our requests. But these verses don't show us so much how to pray, but the God Elijah prays to. And everything suddenly turns in verse 22. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and... The boy's life returns to him, and he lived. The breathless boy's breath was brought back to him. Elijah took him down to the widow, saying, Your son is alive. And can you imagine how the woman breathed again? Can you see the smile on her face? Her sorrow turning to joy, her wailing to dancing, given more than she ever expected. Rejoice. Hallelujah. Praise God. And do you see what he's doing? He displays himself as the Lord of truth and life, not one of many gods, but the unique and sovereign Lord of the universe. Let his life-giving power ring round your thoughts and echo around your mind. He alone is the Lord of life. Just compare him to Baal the supposed god of rain, who is not able to bring rain in this drought. Baal was one of many gods people called on to make their lives better, but he couldn't. And even if the people thought their gods were succeeding for them, no god could overcome the end of life, death. But our Father in heaven, The God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the creator. What do we read in Genesis 2? In the Garden of Eden, he breathed breath into the first man, Adam. And here in this story, he breathes into the breathless boy. Only one God does this. Our God does this. He alone is the Lord of life. And that's what we need to hear if we think like Ian. If we think there are many faiths and they're all just like one and the same, they are not. You either know the Lord of life or you don't. Christianity claims to be unique and exclusive. Of course we respect all peoples, but only one God does this brings life after death. Only one God can get you into heaven forever. 
the Lord of truth and life. And you see, in God's strange but wonderful wisdom, this widow, widow would not have seen who God is. She would not have been able to take him seriously if she'd not been through this trial. Her son dying and rising was the means by which God showed her how big he is. She begins the story thinking he's just a God who can provide flour and oil, but she ends by saying, the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth, the truth, truth above all. Her view of God just got bigger. Friends, we must not be insensitive, but we also must be clear. If we are facing trials here this evening, I don't know why you're facing it. That's not clear. I don't know when it will end. That's not clear. And on the face of it, they may not end positively in your eyes. In this story, the son's life was returned to him and quickly. But God wants us to look beyond life immediate to life eternal, true recovery with Jesus Christ. That is the predictable certainty he wants to give us. Not predictable certainty that healing as I want it will happen tomorrow. But there is another certainty. Even in painful trials, God works for the good of those who love him. It may well that just as this woman saw God bigger and more clearly than she ever had before, God will allow you to walk through your trial so that you are enabled to see him more wonderfully and clearly than before. And how was her sight more clear? Did you see it got personal? Just look at verse 24 again. It is the heart of this story. The woman says to Elijah, I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. Do you remember? Do you know that word Lord, Yahweh, the personal name of the God of Israel? Before she speaks of Elijah being a man of God, Speaking of God, you know, a, a name that could be used of any God, like Baal or others at the time. So she accuses Elijah, I know you're a man of, you're a religious man. By the end of the story, she says, your Yahweh is my Yahweh. Your God is my God. I have seen him and what he has done. I know him. I bow before him. And perhaps in your trial, God is drawing you to know him personally. He is above and beyond us, but he is the Lord of truth and life. Which leaves us asking, where do we see God's goodness, his bigness, his truth and his life today so that we can draw near to him after all, we're not living in this time, in this household. We do not see Elijah. And the answer is in the correct man of God. The man of God, Elijah, showed the widow God's power. We mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Joe said, Elijah in many ways is a man just like us. But the New Testament also speaks of Elijah in a different way. Just flick with me to page 1035 to Luke chapter 7 on page 1035. Because here the New Testament picks up this story and does something rather different with it. Luke chapter 7 and verse 11. You with me? Page 1035. And we're now in the time and story of Jesus. Soon afterwards... Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the town was with her, and when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. 
here is Jesus Christ. Not in Zarephath, but in another unknown, unmentioned town called Nain. And like Elijah, it is early in his ministry. And like Elijah, he's presented with a widow and a dead boy. You see the similarity? Now, can you spot the difference? Verse 14. Jesus went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Did you see it? Did the people see it? Verse 16, they were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. The people could see that Jesus was a prophet like Elijah, a man of God who could bring the son of a widow back to life and give him back to her, a man of God. But they even said, God has come to help his people. What did they mean? Seems unclear here. But we need to be able to see the difference. Did you see it? Jesus did not pray like Elijah. He didn't have to. He didn't have to call on the name of his God in heaven because he is the Lord of truth and life. He is the man of God to listen to, to hear his every word because his words are God's words and his words bring life. He is God's truth. Allow Jesus to blow your mind afresh. Here is the warning to us if we are anything like Jared, if our faith has become old and tired. Elijah had to leave Israel because God's people got tired of their God in his time. Jesus had to leave his hometown and went to places like Nain because people wouldn't listen to him as the Messiah, the Son of God, God himself in his hometown nor would the religious leaders listen. It is quite possible to be here and to be busy here, but to stop being amazed by Jesus and hanging on his words. Not because he's got less amazing, not because his words aren't full of life, but because we simply find other things more interesting. May that not be true of us here. We need not question his character like the woman did. Jesus has proved he is the good shepherd who's laid his life down for us and taken it up again. We need to learn he is good and with us in every trial. We need to see afresh he is the resurrection and the life. He alone has the key to Hades, and is the living one risen from the dead. He is big. He is not simply making this life good, but enabling us to one day walk through death into life with him. And so we need to trust his word. His words are God's words. His words are life. I'll be listening. To the man of God, whose every single word is truth. The people weren't in Elijah's time, but the women did. The world isn't in our time, but will we? Because if we keep listening, what will we hear? Jesus' words in John chapter 5. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Do not be amazed at this. A time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. The question is, are we listening? Just take a moment to respond to the Lord personally in prayer.
Almighty God, how wonderful and how awesome that you would show yourself through Elijah, a man of God speaking your words. And how awesome that you would still show yourself to us through Jesus, through his words in the scriptures. Help us to hear his words, to know they are words of life and truth, and to listen with all our hearts. Amen. Thanks so much, Tim. Now I know that the word of the Lord is the truth. It's a wonderful thing to know. It's even more wonderful to know the Lord and to know him in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet it's true, isn't it? Despite knowing his word, despite knowing him, each of us lives often in a way that does not take him seriously. We still need God's forgiveness and grace. And so before we turn now to a time of communion together, we're going to confess our sins to Jesus and to our Father in heaven. We're going to ask him for his forgiveness. Why not take a moment to read these words on the screen and then we'll say them together. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. As our next song reminds us, in Jesus, all of my weakness meets God's embrace. Failure and sin meets compassion and grace. That's great news. Let's stand and sing and prepare our hearts to receive communion.
such self emptying love, humble redeemer, there on the tree, nothing could stop you from suffering for me. Gentle and lowly, patient and kind, no other Savior like Jesus I find. Though my heart changes, yours never does, ever unchanging compassion and love, gentle and Please do take a seat. Gentle and lowly, patient and kind. No other saviour like Jesus, I find. If Jesus is your saviour this evening, if you've come to him with your sin to receive that compassion and grace, then, then hear what he says to you. He says, draw near to my table and receive from me and remember what I've done for you. Just to say practically, in a few moments, the stewards will come and encourage you to come to the front to receive communion down the middle of the church here. Just form two lines. There'll be two of us at the front with bread and people with wine either side. And if you prefer to have um, a bit of bread dipped in wine rather than taking from a common cup, make sure you're, you're in front of me and give me the now universal symbol for dipping, which I think I've decided on is this. Great. And there's also gluten-free and non-alcoholic wine available. Please do just ask. But let's pray this prayer together before we come to receive from Jesus. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you, Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Can those here helping come up to the front line?
chains of my disgrace. You chose the cross. From the grave victorious, you rose again so glorious. You chose the cross. The chose the cross with every breath, the perfect life, the perfect death. You chose the cross, crown of thorns you wore for us, crowned us with eternal life. You Though his soul was overwhelmed 
Let's say this prayer together. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for reassuring us at this communion of your favor and goodness towards us, that we are truly members of the body of your Son, and that we are also heirs to the hope of your eternal kingdom. We humbly beg you, Heavenly Father, to keep us as faithful members of your church and to strengthen us by your Spirit so that we may fulfill those good works which you have prepared for us to do through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing again a song that reminds us of all that God has done for us. Let's stand to sing together. Creator God, who shaped the earth and heavens, your glory shines in all that you have made. You spoke the word, who broke into the darkness, all earth replies, majestic is your name. Please don't rush off. Just tea and coffee at the back. Let's continue to be gathered together. But let me finish our formal time of a prayer. Father in heaven, as we've been singing, would you help us to wait in eager expectation for that day when you make all creation new. And Lord, as we leave this place this evening and go into the week ahead, would you give us faith and hope and joy and love. And with the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go with us and remain with us always.
Amen. Please do have a seat.